So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the officials of Moab. God's anger was kindled because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road, with a drawn sword in his hand. So the donkey turned off the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it scraped against the wall and scraped Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck it again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place, where there was no way to turn to either the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you right now. But the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I been in the habit of treating you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed down, falling on his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? I have come out as an adversary, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let it live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now therefore, if it is displeasing to you, I will return home. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you to speak. So Balaam went on with the officials of Balak. Well, today is donkey day, and I do hope you're going to go out and take your picture with the donkey. There are a lot of stories of donkeys in the Bible. I bet you can name some. Think for a minute. Can you think of a, a story in the Bible that has a donkey in it? Yeah, Mary riding on the donkey into Bethlehem. Jesus riding on Palm Sunday on the donkey into Jerusalem. There's also a story of King David and King Solomon riding on donkeys. But my favorite of all is this story of the talking donkey. It's, it's not as well known. In fact, uh, I have his permission to tell you this. Last night when I was uh, beginning to work on the sermon and Dan, my husband, asked me, what are you preaching on? And I said, Numbers 22. And he said, what's that? I said, you know, the story of the talking donkey. And he's like, yeah, right. There's no talking donkey in the Bible. There is. And it's such a great story. But to really understand the story, you have to go back a little bit to uh, get the scenes that are happening before we hit the part that we heard this morning. So travel with me all the way back. The Israelites have just crossed the Red Sea. They've wandered in the wilderness. Do you remember how long? 40 years. They're coming to the end of their 40 years. And it's about time to go into the promised land. And the only thing that's standing between them and the promised land are the kingdoms of Edom, Ammon, and Moab. And the Hebrew people tried to play friendly with them, but their numbers were so great that the kings of those countries were threatened and came at them for war. God's provision was with them, and the Israelites beat the Ammonites and the Edomites. And now they're on the border of Moab, and the king of Moab, Balak, is understandably afraid. So he dreams up this whole scheme to help protect him and his country. He's going to send his officials to a prophet for hire. Back then you could hire a prophet to come and, and divine the future for you. He was going to ask this prophet for hire to curse the Hebrew people so that they wouldn't have the power to win in battle. And he sends his elders and officials to Balaam, this prophet for hire. And Balaam receives them, hears about what Balak wants him to do. And he asks him to spend the night while he prays about it. He comes back and said, God said no. Well, Balak, as you can imagine, was not very happy with that answer. So he sends him back and said, give him whatever he wants. 
And Balaam tells those messengers, even if you were to give me the king's house full of silver and gold, I would not go against what God says. Isn't that awesome? But he prays, and God tells him to go on, but to only do what God says. And so Balaam gets on his trusty donkey, and they head off. And not very far into the journey, the donkey starts acting completely wonky, right? I mean, first they're going down the path, and the donkey, just for no apparent reason, veers off into a field. And then the donkey goes so close to a wall that he scrapes Balaam's foot. And if that weren't enough, no matter how much Balaam is pulling him back and swatting him, the donkey just lays down right there in the path with Balaam sitting on top. And then the craziest thing of all, the donkey just looks up like it's the most natural thing in the world and begins to have this very logical conversation with Balaam. Why do you keep hitting me? Balaam, you have embarrassed me, humiliated me. The donkey reasons with him, well, you know, I've always been trustworthy. And then suddenly God opens Balaam's eyes and Balaam, it's interesting, he was the prophet, the one who's supposed to see things first, right? The donkey sees what Balaam didn't and suddenly Balaam sees that angel blocking the way. Now, when you think of this angel and picture in your mind, don't picture the cute little cherubs with wings or even the smiling guardian angels. This was a fierce messenger from God, a warrior angel with a sword in the hand there to block Balaam's way. And when Balaam sees him, he's immediately repentant and vows to go home. But the angel said, no, I want you to go forward but only do what God says. And don't you know that Balak, who has hired this prophet to come curse the Israelites, is surprised when Balaam actually shows up and pronounces a blessing on the Israelites. They win the battle and ultimately make it to the promised land. It's such a great story. Can't you just see it, see that talking donkey in your mind? In my mind, it's like a Disney or Pixar movie, and the, the talking donkey from Shrek is playing the leading role. You can could, you could picture it, right? Unexpected messenger. Our, our overarching theme of this sermon series, Animals of the Bible, is unexpected messengers. And we're going to look how, through words and actions, different animals bring the message of God. And the donkey is a great first start because what's more unexpected than a talking donkey, right? How many of you walk around looking for donkeys to talk to you? And, and honestly, I have to tell you, if you show up in my office and you tell me that a donkey has given you a message from God that you're supposed to tell me, we're going to have some serious conversations about psychological professionals. <laughs> unexpected messengers. But the Bible is full of them, aren't they? In fact, Balaam was an unexpected messenger. He wasn't even a Hebrew. He was a foreigner from another land who brings the blessing. Think about unexpected messengers in the Bible. It was a stranger who told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have the promised child. Rahab, the prostitute, was the messenger of protection and rescue for the Hebrew people going to check out the promised land. Uh, lions and a fiery furnace were messengers of God's protection. Mud in the hand of Jesus was a messenger of healing for the man born blind. And blindness was a messenger from God for Paul. And even Jesus, in so many ways, was an unexpected messenger. They didn't expect a baby born in Bethlehem or someone riding a donkey they expected a king, a noble king on a horse, coming as a mighty warrior of God. I wonder, I wonder what those unexpected messengers might look like for us today. Maybe, maybe it would look like 
circumstances and a, and a sense of um, dis-ease inside. That's the way it was for Joseph Simmons. You know who that is? He was one of the beginners or, or early people in the hip-hop group uh, Run DMZ. He had everything, a successful career, awards, money, fame. And yet he knew deep inside that something was missing and that dissatisfaction pushed him. It was a messenger to seek something else. And he turned to God to seek God and ultimately found God and now uses his stardom and his influence to spread God's message. For a small church in West Texas, it looked like cows, not talking cows. But this church was struggling to pay their bills and, and to stay open. And someone looked at a cow and it became a message of hope when they realized if ranchers and farmers can make money from cows, why can't churches? So this church started raising cattle as a way to pay for their ministry. I remember years ago for me, the unexpected messenger was my sister-in-law. I was in a church, the only pastor of a busy church, and I was the mom of two small children. And I was feeling torn. I, I loved my church and I loved my children and there just wasn't enough of me to go around. And I was trying to figure out what to do and I prayed and prayed and I looked in all the usual places and I couldn't get a sense of leading. And then, one day, standing in the kitchen on a beach vacation with our extended family, I was making lunch for my nephew and I had an apple and I asked his mom, my sister-in-law, how he liked his apple. And she looked at me and said, you know, I'm not quite sure he usually eats apples at the sitters, so you'll have to ask him. That's no profound biblical message. But in that moment, it was absolutely 100% clear to me. I wanted to know how my children ate their apples. I wanted to be the one to kiss the boo-boos on their knees and cheer their small victories. And I was completely sure in that moment that for the next season of my life, God was calling me to focus on being a mom. And several years later, I was equally as sure when I had from some unexpected places, the message that it was time to step back into full-time ministry. I wonder, I wonder how many times God is trying to give us a message and we miss it, either because the message isn't what we expect or it comes in a way that we don't expect. How many times do we have preconceived ideas of what the messenger is supposed to look like or sound like, and so we miss what they're saying? Or how many times are we, like Balaam, so intent on going the way that we think we're supposed to go that we can't see God trying to lead us in another direction? My friends, God sends unexpected messengers. He has through the ages even in rec more recent history, some of the greatest turns and movements have been started in very subtle, unexpected ways. Rosa on a bus. A Catholic nun in the streets of Calcutta. A German pastor, Bonhoeffer, in letters from prison. The list could go on and on. You could make your own list. Just this past weekend, we laid a wonderful, not us personally, but our culture, our nation, laid a wonderful, unexpected prophet to rest. Rachel Held Evans was not someone that you would expect to be a messenger from God. She wasn't a Bible scholar. She wasn't a pastor. She was a journalist, blogger, humor writer. And yet, through her writings, telling her story of her struggles and her journey in faith, she reshaped the conversation in the Christian church, especially in the evangelical church. And she helped us see through her beautiful writing how God invites us into a faith that's big enough for questions and doubts. And she raised the possibility of radical authenticity. 
and radical hospitality and acceptance. And the world is a better place. The church is a better place because of her voice, unexpected voice that fortunately some people were able to hear. And as we gather around the table this morning, I, I think about one of her quotes, one of my favorite of her quotes. She says, this is what God's kingdom is like. This, this table. A bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or wealthy or good, but because they are hungry and because they have said yes. And there's always room for more. Isn't that beautiful? My friends, God is still bringing God's message to God's people. And I invite you to come to this table with open hearts and open minds, expectant of what God might say or do in you in this sacrament of grace. And then as you leave this room this morning, that you go into your lives filled with a sense of wonder and expectation as you see and listen with your ears and your hearts for where God might bring unexpected messages, not letting preconceived notions about what the messenger should look like block the message, but being fully open to all that what God wants to do in and through us through God's unexpected messengers. <clears throat>